Uh, I'm John Mulladew, and I'm a member of the What Matters to Me and Why Organizing Committee and a Senior Director of Communications in the Office of Strategic Communications. And I want to welcome you to this 23rd in our series of, of talks designed to build and strengthen bonds between people who teach, learn, and work together daily and to foster understanding of how each of us embraces the UCI values. The Advisory Council on Campus Climate, Culture, and Inclusion, with the support of the Office of the Chancellor, began presenting this series in 2000 and, uh, 2012, I should say, to offer a, a glimpse at what's behind the persona and to provide a chance to ask questions of esteemed members of our faculty and staff who make UCI such an exceptional place. Now, a few details before we begin. As you can see, this event is being videoed. If you do not wish to be on the video, we suggest that you move further to the back of the room. Now, following the talk, please complete the survey that you were handed. Your feedback is very valuable and helps inform our planning. Also, when you leave, please take your trash with you and uh, dispose of it in the cans outside. Our next talk is scheduled for January 13th, so there's no talk in, in December. Uh, the January talk will feature Mary Gilley, who's a professor of marketing and senior associate dean in the Paul Mirage School of Business. Registration will open approximately three weeks prior to the talk, probably before the winter break. But watch your email for the invitation and or go to our website beginning you know, sort of mid-December-ish. Now this series attracts a diverse uh, audience of faculty, staff, and students from across the campus. So before each speaker is introduced, it's our tradition uh, to have you take a minute or so to introduce yourself to the person next to you and just let them know who you are and why you're here. 60 seconds. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce the person who will introduce our speaker. Here's engineering lecturer and president of UCI Interfaith, John Stupar. Thank you, John, and thank you for the applause. I didn't expect that. <laughs> First of all, being a, a member of uh, one of the organizers uh, uh, on the committee, I really want to thank you all for attending. You are what makes this all work, uh, along with our speakers. And uh, uh, I believe the mission that we have here is an awesome one. And so thank you for being here. It's my honor to introduce our speaker, Daphne Lay is professor of drama in the UCI Claire Trevor School of the Arts, and she also is the head of the doctoral studies in drama. She's internationally known for her work on Chinese opera, Asian American theater, intercultural theater, and the diasporic and transnational performance which we had an interesting little discussion beforehand. Uh, she's the author of many scholarly articles in both English and Chinese, and has written two books, one in 2006 titled Operatic China, Staging Chinese Identity Across the Pacific. And in 2011, she wrote Alternative Chinese Opera in the Age of Globalization. Performing Zero. That sounds interesting. I think that might be an interesting read. Locally, Daphne's been recognized for her endeavors in advocating multicultural performances and promoting diversity and equity through creative means. In 2007, she founded and has since directed Multicultural Spring, which is a UCI program that promotes multicultural performances. And in 2012, she created Dramatic Transformations, which is an annual research performance project to raise awareness of diversity through drama. Just recently, she launched Theater Walks, and she asked that I spell out walks, W-O-K-S, maybe you'll explain that, <laughs> Theater Walks. Uh, to foster Asian American talents and to raise awareness of Asian and Asian American theater on campus here. Just two weeks ago, Daphne was elected the new president of Astra, 
which is the American Society for Theater Research, which is a US-based professional society that fosters theater research and scholarship. And so, with that new position, her vision and her dedication to equity and diversity and multiculturalism will help guide and influence the field of theater research in the US for the next three years. And now, for the next hour, she is anxious to bear her soul and share with us what matters to her most and why. So let's give a warm anteater welcome to Daphne Lay. Thanks. Thank you, John and John, for the introductions. And, and thank you, Doug, for the invitation. Um, this has been such a fun series, and I always enjoy coming here. So when I got the invitation, I was so thrilled. Yes, I get to tell my stories. Um, I also want to thank my sisters there in Taiwan, who helped me digging out um, old photo albums and found out like my family history. So a lot of this talk is about my family. So I want to call this talk, Wrong Place, Wrong Time. <laughs> I got the inspiration actually from my dear friend, Simon Leong, and who described a very difficult situation I was in a few months ago as, you were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I thought, okay, maybe he was just comforting me. But it was also like a moment of revelation. It was like the clouds just open up and the sun shines through and there's music. Yes, wrong place, wrong time. These words perfectly describe my life. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'll start my story um, with my family. A few years ago, I overheard the conversation happening in the hallway. And it was Katie's voice. She was telling other students that she has uh, eight siblings, so nine children total in her family. And there was another voice asking, Mormon? And I heard her voice reply, Catholic. <laughs> I thought, well, if at that moment I opened my door and joined the conversation and told them, my family, we have six children, and the youngest one is a boy. And I guess the question to me will be, Chinese? <laughs> and I will reply, Damn right, Chinese. <laughs> Both my parents came from very well-to-do families in China, but basically lost everything when they moved to Taiwan in 1949 after, after the communists took over. And I want to try to get the slides here. So my father's story it's a familiar one. Um, it was during a summer break, and he was a 20-year-old student, college student. He went to visit his, father, uh, his, his brother in the coastal city. And the civil war between the Communist Party and the Nationalist Party had been going on for quite a while <coughs> by that time. But no one really believed it would, it would be so severe that that would actually change the world. So it was during her, his visit and the situation got so bad that he left with his brother's family to Taiwan. Never saw his parents again. Didn't even take a photo with him. Never, nothing. Can you imagine that? If you go up to Santa Barbara to visit your cousins for a weekend and never saw your home again. There was no communication for decades. He didn't even know his parents were dead or alive. His parents didn't have any information about him. I didn't know how he went through that period. I didn't know when he gave up hope. I didn't know when his parents gave up hope. He didn't know about his parents' death until much, um, you know, a, a long while afterwards. Last month, when we had a speaker here, um, Dr. McGall, and he was talking about free college education, and I was thinking about my parents. 
if it's not for the free college that was set up by the government at that time for these young students, I think my parents would have had a very difficult time. My parents actually met in college. My father was 20, my mother was 17. This was a little long um, afterwards. But they met in a, in a college, uh, they were college classmates, and they studied uh, land administration and urban planning. And that was very skill, very good skill to have uh, in a post-war Taiwan. And my father actually moved up the rank step by step um, pretty well in, in his government position. So when he retired, he was in a very high position. So war has deeply affected my parents' lives, but I grew up in peace. <laughs> well, I should say um, it was peace, sort of tightly controlled by the Cold War mentality. Um, but when I was growing up, money was always tight. Um, but in spite of, or maybe because, because of the lack of material means, my mother always stressed our prestigious family lineage. In China, there was this practice called imperial examination, which lasts about you know, over a thousand years. And it is a kind of grueling test. It is a test on the um, classics. And so sometimes I imagine maybe it's like taking SAT a few days in a row, or like in my program, my doctoral students, the first year comprehensive exams, which they have to write essays for three straight days. But they don't have to memorize the classics. And these people did. Um, it is a literary test on um, classics, but it also functions as a, a civil test, which means if you do well and, you, and score high, then you might get a government position. And because of this, um, because of this record, I could go back to uh, 32 generations of my family. Um, and so this is like the, the record they have from the first generation, which was probably in about 15th century or so. And because they record uh, the exam, the position they get. So for instance, this is a list of the people who passed the exam, what position he got. And the, the person that's highlighted uh, is actually my grandfather, my father's father. And then if you can read Chinese, you can see he's got, he took the exam actually at the, during the time of the last emperor. So he was probably one of the last people who took the exam. So because of this, this is the official record. That's why we have this family history. We have this family record. But unfortunately, they only recorded half of the ancestors because no girls are allowed to take the exams and no girls were recorded. So I had no idea if my great-great-great-great-grandfather had any daughters or sisters at all, as if they never had daughters. However, um, and as, as you can see, this is probably one of the reasons why that uh, people with traditional Chinese values want to have sons. And even my mother had a very good education and had a very good upbringing. She could not escape this curse. Despite the end of uh, imperial examination by early 20th century, its effect lingered on, at least in my family. My father taught us classical texts such as, uh, such as Confucius' Analects and many, many uh, classical poetry, poems, and asked us to memorize them. And it was actually fun. My sister and I developed these competitive games, see who can memorize more, right? And I don't know if you, have you noticed this, that things you memorize as a child will stay with you all your life. <laughs> and things you read yesterday, you won't even remember, <laughs> right? Uh, 
I can't right. So I can't tell you how. So you know, I still now I still remember a lot of the computers and a lot of the poetry. And then there are a, a few very long poems that are really really dear to my heart. And I can't tell you how much they have helped me in my life. Uh, so so I often recite them. Sometimes when I'm in really extreme boredom, I will recite them. And sometimes I recite them to combat really kind of physical pain, that kind of situation. Like when I get when I was getting my blood drawn, or you know when I was going through labor. Um, if I can get myself focused a few minutes on a poem, at least for a few minutes, I'm in this world of colors and sounds, of rhythms and rhymes. And really, I think this is a very, very uh, useful skill. So if you don't have a long poem memorized, you should go home and find one and start tonight. <laughs> it is really important and very useful. And as a kid, I just excelled everything language related. I kept a daily journal since about age seven, and then this practice you know, went on well into my adult life. And I won various um, speech competitions and went on the radio to tell a story when I was nine. And I published my first essay when I was 10 in a newspaper. So, and I, and I became an English major in college. Um, in order to practice English, I started acting and directing plays in English. And that's kind of how I got into the professional. My mother didn't have a scholarly family genealogy, but her father, my maternal grandfather, rose out quickly in the military ranks during the war. And this is World War II we are talking about, and became a general. And actually working very closely with Chiang Kai-shek before retreating from China. And he retired pretty soon after he got to Taiwan and died when I was only four. So I didn't know him very well. And my mother, she was the oldest child. And she was the most adventurous one. She often said, I should have been a boy. She was very brave. At age 14, she took a long journey um, alone to meet up with her father so she could go to the high school in that city. And the only thing, the only transportation she had at that time was this boat, which was returning from the war zone, full of uh, wounded soldiers. And she was the only girl on that boat. And she, held, she had um, my grandfather's name card, business card. It was sort of like her past. Apparently, she only needed to tell people, I'm the daughter of this person, and people will escort her there. But so, you know, so that, was, that must have been 1945, and when the war just ended. And a boat was going upstream 300 miles in the Yangtze River with this 14-year-old girl and lots of wounded soldiers. My mother talked about how gingerly she was walking around the soldiers and how scared she was because she was the only girl there. And she often talked about the limit of her gender, how she was confined by that. Well, she didn't exactly use these words because she didn't have any training in feminist theory or gender theories. The only thing she could say was, well, how much she wished she could have been a man. She was brave, adventurous, creative, articulate, and she had good vision and really, really good plans. She was a natural leader. And yet, she had to quit her job, stay home to, to take care of children. And remember, she was a classmate of my father, so they had equal training. They had the um, same kind of training. And she could only hope her daughters would, be, would do OK and hope she could produce a son. She used to tell me that when I was little, she would uh, buy me boy toys, like you know, uh, toy guns, I assume, and dress me up with uh, like a boy style boots. I was never a girly girl, and I always hated pink anyway, so I assume I enjoy those toys. But perhaps I was just trying to suppress 
some bad memory about myself being at the wrong place at the wrong time. <coughs> Maybe I inherited my mother's adventurous spirit. So I traveled across the Pacific Ocean and crossed the continent and crossed back. And eventually, I settled in the lovely OC and joined UCI 14 years ago. But I want to go back a little bit. My story about my parents is not done yet. It was Cambridge, Massachusetts. I was working on my doctoral degree. One night, in the middle of the night, actually, the phone rang. Don't answer the phone in the middle of the night, because it's never good news. My sister was sobbing on the other end of the line. Mom was diagnosed of advanced gallbladder cancer. She was only 60 or 61. How is that possible? She's too young for that. And before she got too sick, she came visit me. And we drove everywhere. You know, we got we got wet in the Niagara Falls. We got scared at CN Tower when we walked on the glass floor. We even, I even went, uh, took her to see Bread and Puppet in Vermont. Um, I was just offering her the, the best thing, I, the best fun I could think of myself. But all she really wanted to see was that I was doing all right. I was a child away from home, and she wanted to know I was doing all right. Because Boston was 9,000 9, miles away from home, and I only saw her a couple of times um, in the next year. When spring, when spring break came next year, I thought about going back to see her, but I didn't really have money. I was rehearsing a play I wrote at Harvard. I was going to a conference at NYU. I did not understand priorities. I did not understand that I can always do another show and go to another conference. And money is always the least important thing in the world. But you never know these things when you're in your 20s. Nowadays, if a student comes to me and tells me about the dilemma in life, I will definitely address life priorities. We only have one life, and life won't wait. Anything else can and will wait. A month later, again, I received a phone call from my father, also in the middle of the night. Three days, my dad said. The doctor predicted three days. That was probably the longest journey in my life. I had no idea whether I could make it or not. At the airport in Taiwan, I saw this payphone, and I hesitated. Should I call the hospital? What would I find out? I did eventually, and my mom was there saying, I'm wait for you. Perhaps an hour later, I finally reached her bedside. She could no longer speak, but I knew she saw me because her eyes twinkled. She passed away 15 minutes later. My, fa my mom never got to know my wonderful boys. Milo, this, this was um, Milo's graduation, and this, you can tell this is uh, near the Brain Event Center just a few months ago. So Milo, the person in the gown, um, who's a college freshman now, and he is one of the smartest people I know. He has such lucid mind and clear logic, and he will never lose an argument. <laughs> Everyone told us that he should be a lawyer when he was seven or eight. And Rafe, the person in white, is here with me today. He's an amazing pianist and a very fantastic soccer player. His fingers has magic. When he massaged the keyboard, that can produce such beautiful sound, and I would just cry. Raising children is tough for everyone. And it's 
tougher for somebody who's working and basically doing all, most of the childcare, like myself. So I really highly depend on good luck. When my kids were little, I used to have this little TV and I have some Pokemon tapes and some snack and toys in my office. That's my emergency kit. <laughs> in case my kids are sent home from school and I have to teach a class. And as you know, college professors don't have substitutes. Maybe I can put my kids in, in my office and watch a video and nobody will find out. <laughs> Luckily, I never, need to use, I never needed to use my emergency kit and I really had good luck. Um, so, and then I think another thing about raising children is it is the most amazing thing is really to grow with them, uh, to learn new things with them, and to learn about my own limits. And another great thing is to, to learn how big we can be. Children could be the cruelest human beings in the world, <laughs> right? And yeah, parents can always grow bigger to accommodate that with their love. And I think that's a, just a very amazing thing I find out about raising children. And my, uh, my husband, David, who taught me everything about being a good scholar. I would say more than all my professors combined could have taught me. I grew up in a family full of sisters. This, this we took uh, just a few months ago at my sister's um, birthday party, so we were just goofing around. As you can see, I'm the tallest one. <laughs> I'm proud of that. So I grew up in a family full of sisters, but now I live in a world that is very masculine, both my family and the academia. They are both male dominant. And I'm actually grateful that my boys train me well. I know how to yell back at a naughty boy. <laughs> and talk to a bullying man. So let's not forget about Pixel. She lets me know about her life priorities. So last year, when Milo was 17, I thought it would be neat to tell him about my life when I was 17. So remember I took journal since age seven. So I dug out my old diary and I was very surprised to buy what I found. Inside the diary, there's a little red envelope with a note inside from my mom. It was a simple note, just wishing me birthday and wishing me doing well at school. But what surprised me was actually what I wrote myself on that day. I wrote, probably with a, some kind of melancholic voice, on an early morning, 17 years ago, I was born. <clears throat> and this is what my mom wrote in her diary when I turned one month old. And this is what my mom wrote. I was quoting her. Wei Wei, which is my nickname. Wei Wei is one month old today. She's growing up with all our love. If she were a boy, there would be even more people who would love her. Suddenly, everything came back to me. All these years, I had been pretending that I was doing all right. Sure, I tumbled and fell, but I learned well, and I stood up, and I thought I was doing all right. People accepted me and admired me, and suddenly, I remember everything. I remember I was not wanted. Not me. My mom loved me. But my sex, my sex was not wanted. I should have been a boy. I was born in the wrong place at the wrong time. My mom was born in the wrong place at the wrong time. If I had been a boy, maybe my mom would have stopped producing children and gone back to work. 
if my mom had been a boy, maybe she would have had a great career, like her father being a great general, or like my <coughs> father being a high rank official, or even something better. I kept reading a diary from the 17-year-old me. There's resentment, complaints, sorrow, anger. Well, typical diary for a teenager who was pretending she understood Sartre and Nietzsche. <laughs> but there's also the sense of indignation, a strong desire to address the injustice and inequity in the world. Like my mother, I didn't have the proper language either. I only asked myself repeatedly, why do I have to be a girl? Why is the world so unfair? Now everything makes sense to me. Why I have done what I have, what I have done is because I couldn't find a better way to get justice. Even though I suppressed all my memory and grew up okay, deep down I knew the world was un fundamentally unfair and I wanted to make it right. I needed to find justice for myself and for others. There was a reason why I was attracted to gender and ethnic studies. There was a reason I was doing multiculturalism. So a few years after I started teaching at UCI, I started a program called Multicultural Spring. So it's a program involving inviting uh, artists from different cultures and uh, performance traditions to do master classes for students. So this is uh, Indian dance um, called Manipuri dance. And this is Chinese opera. Uh, because I felt it was unfair to exclude other tradi uh, performance traditions from our curriculum. And I also wanted our students to know the hegemony of method acting is actually not universal. Um, and I serve as an equity uh, advisor for three years because I deeply believed in the value of equity and diversity, and, and I really wanted to know how we could do it in an institution. I was growing up with a feeling of injustice, but without the language to address it, because people, people didn't address it. I went through grad school being the only other Asian, person of color, immigration, you name it, I was it. Um, I was the diversity except they didn't know that word. I didn't know that word. There was no mentoring of underrepresented minority students because people didn't talk about underrepresentation. I just felt like a weirdo. I just feel I didn't belong. I just feel I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Three years ago, I started a program called Dramatic Transformations. So. These are the three shows we did. The first one, Diversity Veil, Diversitopia, Diversity K. So every year we do a show. I wanted more people to care about diversity and equity, but I didn't want to bore them with a lecture. Therefore, we interview students and use their words to write a play. And just let me show you just a little bit of a very powerful thing. I hope we can hear it. So this is a scene between a Latina student who was interviewing for UCI grad school, and this is her uh, future advisor. And this is we got this story from the interview. She was interviewing, and the professor said, "Can I ask you a personal question?" She said, "Sure." And the professor says how come you don't have any children or you're not pregnant? Because every Latina in my lab has children. <laughs> so of course she was very angry and then she thought, okay, I'm sorry I didn't live up to your stereotype. And, but she explained to, her, to him that you know, she didn't want to have children now because they were getting away, so that's her life priority, uh, school and all that. So this is a story we got from the interview, and this student chose to come to UCI even after this horrible interview. And I don't know if you could hear the gasp 
from the audience. And that was a really, really powerful just reconfirmation of what drama can do. Because just, just hear the, student, um, the audience response um, is really, really powerful. So we did this for three years, and the feedbacks have been really positive. Because systema systematic racism, sexism, or xenophobia is just so deep, and it is so much ingrained in our national and social history. We cannot fix it with a Band-Aid. We need to have honest conversations, and we need to keep having conversations. I feel every year I cracked open the hard surface a little bit and revealed a little bit more question and have a little bit more dialogue. And I really think this kind of conversation needs to happen again and again because people forget, because situation change. And I hope the administration will continue supporting this project. And I, I truly think it's worth it. Wrong place, wrong time. It is exactly the sense of being wrong place at the wrong time. The sense of injustice that has propelled me all my life and let me do, let me do what I want to do today. What matters to me is that everyone should be able to have a voice and be able to do what they want to do. And they should be treated equally. I just became the president of the American Society of Theater Research. When I stood at the podium two weeks ago, addressing an audience of a few hundred, I could easily imagine I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The prestigious society was formed about 60 years ago. And I bet the founding fathers were not imagining someone like me will be standing there. 60 years later for this American society. Wrong place, wrong time. I still feel very often I'm in a wrong place at the wrong time. The truth is, the higher I go, the fewer women and fewer people of color I see. Maybe I should thank my wrongness. I would not have known what would matter to me and why if everything had been Right. I will end this talk by showing you this picture. <laughs> this is a three-year-old girl armed with her mother's great expectation for her. I think she was ready to change the world. What do you think? Thank you.